Uh, my name is Edgar. Uh, my uh, talk today is about how we model uh, variables that have been collected uh, over multiple locations on, on the river network. So let's say when we have rather than two sensors, when we have, let's say, 50 uh, special locations, and we have uh, repeated measurements from those. So we have time series or big data in that case. So uh, basically this work on the first part is going to be about how do we uh, model that statistically, how do we capture that relationship in space, but also in time. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about uh, how do we detect anomalies on data that has this uh, uh, basically from um, spatial temporal data. So this uh, work is in collaboration with a group of co-authors from here from Australia, but also from the, from the US. Um, some of the previous speakers were commenting about how our recent advances on uh, sensor technologies allowing us now to uh, take uh, recordings or measurements of uh, water quality variables almost in real time. So this, these are one of the um, water quality sensors that uh, uh, the Department of Environment and Science have been um, placing on the Herbert. And that's myself, by the way, statistician on the, on the field. Um, so, um, so this uh, uh, a range of new sensors is creating data that has um, a temporal correlation, but then we have multiple of them within the same uh, network. So we have this uh, very uh, unique kind of data set. So uh, this is creating a lot of attention. So this uh, new kind of uh, data sets. And this kind of models that we are then developing is allowing us uh, to basically assess really uh, critical questions, such as, for example, uh, evaluating uh, the impact of climate change or studying pollution, etc. Um, suppose here we have a, a, a very simple um, uh, network with only four special locations, and we can see on there the flow of the water. Uh, on those, uh, we have those four special locations that we have repeated measurements. Uh, if we want to, um, to make inference about what we, or we want to predict what happened on a special location one, that's going to be highly correlated to what we observe in a special location, let's say two, three, and possibly four. So they are connected by flow and the water is flowing in that, this uh, direction. However, what we um, observe in special location two might not be correlated to what we observe, for example, in special location four because they are not connected by flow, right? So on these um, uh, special temporal models, we are going to consider factors uh, such as flow connectivity, and we are also going to consider, for example, stream, stream distance. So um, there is a lot of work in statistics around uh, modeling uh, this kind of uh, data uh, they call it uh, geostatistical models, but they use Euclidean distance. So they, they, they don't take into consideration these unique characteristics on the network like flow connectivity. So in our work, we are going to consider these, these factors. Um, so here we have a representation of the same network, but in multiple time points. So we have t equal one, two, to capital T. And let's say that we want to make a prediction uh, to uh, what happened on, let's say for, um, a parameter such as nitrate on a special location S3. So in that case, that is going to be, for example, conditional on what happened on, on, the, on the same special location, and let's say t equal two, t equal one, etc. but also on what happened on the neighboring sites at uh, t equal three. So we want to, we are going to consider all of these uh, relationships in, in our models. So here we have um, uh, the model that we are proposing in this work is basically a linear model that you have seen probably a thousand times where a response variable, let's say nitrate, is, uh, uh, is represented as a linear combination of some covariates. This could be, for example, elevation, temperature, or something else. And then what is new here is that we are incorporating a parameter V that is going to allow us to capture this uh, special correlation, right? So um, the new things on this model are the parameters that are in red and in blue. So in blue, we have sigma, that is a covariance matrix that is going to basically allow us to borrow information from the neighbors and establish correlation from the, from the neighboring sites. And then um, the parameter phi that is in red is going to be a, a, transition, a transition matrix that is going to be used for the vector autoregression process that we are going to use. So we are going to basically auto-regress from previous time points. 
So one of the complexities from this model is that when we have 100 special locations, we have uh, a high dimensional um, transition metrics. So we have a lot of parameters to estimate. So in this work, we propose uh, different approaches. So we go from a very simple case where uh, the transition matrix um, is basically zero everywhere apart from the diagonal elements and all the elements on the diagonal are the same, which means that every special location is going to have the same amount of autocorrelation. But then we have some more proposals. So we have uh, all cases where the autocorrelation is going to be site specific. So you may have some sites with a really high autocorrelation. So what is new on this model is that uh, it's going to be spatial temporal. It's going to capture that correlation in space and time. And also we are going to use a uh, Bayesian inference. So, and that has uh, some benefits. You might be thinking how good are those models, you know, compared to other models available in, in the literature. So that's why we have a case study. Uh, in this case study, uh, we are going to look at uh, the mean daily water temperature on the Boise River in the US. And you can see the branching network on there uh, is quite large. So it spans over more than 7,000 kilometers. And we have only 42 special locations, right? So one of the things that we want to do in here is to make predictions across the whole branching network using data only from 42 special locations. And we want to do that as well in time. So we want to make predictions in time as well. Um, here is a representation of the data, but in time series. So we are going to use um, a group of covariates that are really highly correlated with, uh, with water temperatures. For example, we are going to use the air temperature. You will see there in red that the two, basically the time series of well, water temperatures in black and the time series of air temperature are really highly correlated. They have the same periodical pattern. And then we are going to use another bunch of covariates such as uh, stream slope, elevation, uh, community drainage area. Uh, here is a representation of the same data set, but in, uh, as, as in panel representation. So we have um, the, basically in the x-axis, the, the date when the data is collected. And then in the vertical axis, we have the number of sensors from zero to 42. So to assess how well these kind of models are going to perform, we are going to uh, split the data. So we are going to take 80% of the data to fit the model and learn about the parameters. And then, uh, then we are going to predict the, the rest. So we are going to predict the 20% and we are going to compare to see how well we do right on, the, on that. So that's normally called our sample prediction. Uh, so we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of models that we consider to capture the special variation. So, um, and then we had a lot of options for modeling the temporal correlation. So uh, some, some of these models could be, for example, auto, an autoregressive process or could be a vector autoregression. So we have a, a big combination of space-time models that we can uh, create. So in this work, we created uh, 24 models and then we compared them uh, based on different, for example, information criteria, uh, root mean square prediction error, also based on some qualitative factors. So if you look at the root mean square prediction error, that is how well we can predict the held out data, we see that some of the predictions are really good. So they are around 0.5 of degrees Celsius. So, and they are substantially better to what people have um, reported in the literature. So uh, this Gali's uh, work is basically reporting on what people have found with this kind of data set and with this exact, exact data set as well. So we found that these models tend to outperform those existing in the, in the literature. So we are providing a wide range of um, parameters for comparison. And at the end, for some practitioners, some things might be more uh, critical than others. So. All right, so one of the benefits from um, setting this in, into, into this framework is that we then can go from only do the only uh, 42 special locations, we can then uh, make predictions across the full branching network with more than seven kilometers, right? 7,000 kilometers. So here is a prediction of the water temperatures in four different dates. So from this model, we get the predictions in the whole branching network across the whole uh, time series. So that's one of the, the good things. And then we can do a lot of things with that as well. So we can uh, uh, compute probability est estimates. So we can say, what well, is the probability of exceeding certain uh, probability threshold. So, um, so in this um, 
uh, second part, I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, for example, one of the interesting things with this model is that we can, com we can compute things like, what's the probability of exceeding uh, a threshold, a biological threshold of 13 degrees? So um, from some uh, lab studies, they have found that when the temperature exceeds uh, 13 degrees, it causes uh, thermal stress for the fish, specifically for uh, bull trout. So we were wanted to basically check to in what regions of the network there is a really high probability of exceeding this, this limit. I should say that this can be done with any parameter. If you have data for nitrate, or if you have turbidity or conductivity or whatever you have, we can use this kind of models as well to uh, compute these probability uh, estimates. So here uh, we have on the top a uh, representation of the exceedance probability. So the horizontal lines, 13 degrees, all of those black uh, time series are the 7,000 time series of temperature. And then on the bottom, we have then the, um, the, the, the full network. And then we have the, the probability of exceeding the, the, the limit. So in yellow, we have like a really high probability. So we see that in, for example, in the hottest month of the year, in August, in July and August, we have like a really high probability, mostly around the, the main stem of the, the branching network. Another benefit from using this, this model is that we can then uh, compute the proportion of non-suitable habitat for the fish. So here we have the hottest uh, time periods of the year going from uh, 2011 to 2015. And we could, uh, for example, check uh, on, let's say, um, on uh, 14 of August, 2013, um, approximately 36% of the network is non-suitable habitats for the uh, bull trout. Um, so you might be thinking now how this fits within uh, the, the anomaly detection framework. So one of the things is that um, commonly this data coming from sensors, they have like a lot of anomalies. So, and this can have a mass, massive impact on our models. So they can, they can bias our estimates. Um, previous speakers already mentioned what is an anomaly, what is a technical anomaly. Uh, in our models, we, uh, we are going to take into consideration uh, that we have multiple special locations and it's well established that we need to, to account for that. So we need to take into consideration the special autocorrelation, otherwise we get like bias uh, estimates and trends. And the other thing is that we have um, multiple parameters. So we have, for example, to be the conductivity and level, and those things are, uh, can be highly correlated. And it's uh, well known as well that um, if you analyze them using a univariate analysis, basically you have like a, like a higher uh, probability of false, uh, ne uh, false negative rates. All right, so uh, looking at the literature of anomaly detection, you could find a lot of um, methods, approaches. Uh, here are some, some examples. So for uh, Puwasala was mentioning before about using extreme value theory. So there's plenty of work on that uh, direction. It's really exciting uh, area. Uh, there is as, as well some work, uh, Kath was mentioning as well, and Delaney about the time series outlier detection. So there is plenty of, of work as well in, in that uh, direction. There is uh, also work on uh, statistical process control. So there's plenty of uh, research in that area too. Uh, and then more recently, uh, some work has been done using a heat of market models. I'm going to explain later on what it is. Um, so um, you might be thinking, how do you actually use the, your special temporal model now to detect anomalies? So uh, the first thing that we do is like, we take, the, we take this uh, data, let's say for, from uh, turbidity, and then uh, we feed this special temporal model, right? And then we learn about, let's say the regression coefficients and about the spatial and temporal parameters. And then with those estimates, we then can make predictions from that model, right? So um, we basically make predictions from that model and then compare it with the observed data, right? And then if, if the predicted um, value is very off from the real data, we assume that there is an anomaly, right? So that's why we compute um, this um, error or residual on there, right? So comparing the, what is predicted from the model to what is actually observed. And then we do a lot of things with that. 
if your data is um, non-special, it's just temporal, you can just compute this and then use the rest of the framework that we are, that we are using. But in our case, we have a lot of special locations and we have time series of data and then that's why we apply the special temporal model. So then with these residuals, we can ap apply different approaches, right? So we can use, for example, a uh, posterior predictive distribution. We can say, um, how different is uh, this prediction from the model, from the observed data? And then we can make an inference to say, well, this high probability that this point is going to be anomaly or not. Uh, we can use uh, mixtures. So we can assume that anomalies are generated from a completely different distribution to normal data. So normal data uh, might be generated from a completely different process and anomalies then are generated from a, a, a process that will have like a different kind of distribution. Uh, more recently, I've been working a lot on uh, hidden Markov models. So basically, we assume that we have two states that are, they haven't been observed and they are latent. So one state is normal data that happens most of the time, let's say 95% of the time, and the second state is anomalous. And then they, they both are going to generate data from different distributions. And the idea is looking at the data, we make inference about the state. So we say, well, it's a high probability that we are in the anomalous state or we are in the normal state. Right? And uh, lastly, we have a multivariate statistic where we are going to then consider multiple parameters. We are going to say, well, we're going to model everything together. We're going to model turbidity, conductivity and level, for example, and we have nitrate, we will do the same. And then uh, there are a lot of benefits from using this approach as well. Uh, this, this, this part is still a work in progress. I just wanted to mention that we are currently working on that. All right, so uh, we perform a simulation study to see how well this, uh, this model is actually performed. So uh, Kath mentioned about a, a bunch of uh, anomalies on the data. Uh, for example, um, having large spikes on the data or having a shift on the mean or having high variability or having drift. Some of these anomalies are really difficult and they're really challenging to, uh, for these statistical methods. And in this simulation, the anomalies are not just one point. They could be a range, could be like uh, two hours of data, right? So we consider that as well into, into, the, into the modeling in the simulation. And um, so here are some preliminary results from the models. We have the first method is uh, it's a benchmark. We use a time series approach. This approach is purely uh, uh, temporal. There's no special correlation there. And then we have um, using posterior predictive distribution, using mixtures, using uh, hidden Markov models. Uh, previous speakers talk a lot about what is sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, adjusted accuracy. Um, I will just say that we have found out that uh, this approach that uses posterior predictive distribution seems to be pretty good. And they, it kind of outperformed the, the rest. So still a work in progress, still working, developing this approach, trying to make it more realistically. Um, and now how this performs with real data. So um, um, we have this um, data set uh, using the, the blue spots on the Herbert River that is uh, located in here in Queensland. And we have five special locations or so five sensors, and they have been collecting uh, multiple parameters, turbidity, conductivity, and level. And so we fitted our models to these uh, new um, uh, data sets. And I'm going to show you some of the preliminary results. So here we have time series of uh, turbidity um, just over a couple of days. And we have here in black the time series, and then in blue uh, what we make, the predictions that we made from the model. Uh, the labeled anomalies are in red. So this, all of this region here is anomalous. So this is a, like a drift period on here. So this model here uh, basically identifies as anomaly all of these points here in blue. It also identifies here the beginning of the drift, but then it basically misses the rest of it and misses these two small spikes. But it does quite a good job detecting this uh, range of uh, anomalous data. Uh, this is using the uh, predictive distribution. So a second, a second method is using the hidden Markov model. So on here, we see that this method is more sensitive. So basically identify all of this region as anomalous. It, it does a really good job identifying the drift, it picks these two small spikes. So um, uh, summing up the work, 
uh, we have found that these models that we have been implementing, uh, they, uh, they tend to perform really well compared to those available in the, in the literature. Um, we have found that they, of course, they are using special information. They tend to outperform those that they use only time series data. Um, and then in terms of anomaly detection, they do a good job picking, for example, things like drift. That's some of the methods they kind of struggle. Fisher work, we are doing a lot of work now on the multivariate um, approaches, and we are trying to make this real time. So basically one of the benefits of setting this in the Bayesian framework is that we can fit model, learn about the parameters, and then fit the model with the new data. New data comes in, refit the model and keeps going. So that's one of the things that we are currently uh, working on. And if the work is of interest, there is a paper on archive. There is a recently uh, released an uh, R package, it's and base that I am going to talk this afternoon about um, how to fit models when we use CNSS and base. And there is a manuscript that is uh, currently in preparation on anomaly detection on spatial temporal data stream networks. Thank you for your attention.